Welcome back to Karaka Nights again and here we are online live to your lounge room, to your phones, to wherever you're joining us from. Thank you for joining us and good to see you again. My name is Wee Yong Yu. I'm the lead pastor of Every Nation Auckland City Karaka Nights. So, you know, a week ago I was saying that the hope is that in New Zealand, in Auckland particularly, we would be out of level three lockdown, but that hasn't happened. But in the positive light, 
there has been progress. So let's focus on the positives and the hope and the prayer is that we would be able to catch up again in person in some way, shape or form in the near future. We hope that you're well. We hope that you've um, been able to adjust and adapt uh, the best way you can um, in this particular lockdown if you're in Auckland. Uh, I was talking to someone recently. They were saying that the very first lot of lockdown when we went to level four and then we went down to three and two and finally to one and had a 102 days of COVID free paradise here in New Zealand. Um, that last lockdown um, a lot for a lot of people uh, were, was difficult, but this particular one seems to be a lot more uh, difficult for some people. Maybe it's because it's a little bit shorter and everyone's waiting for things to get better. But you know what? Let's take a moment um, aside from what's going on around in our worlds to focus in our thoughts on God. And if you're a Christian here today, we want, want to uh, ask you to join us uh, in a time of worship, singing words of praise and worship, expressing what is in our heart towards our God. So let me pray and let's have a time of worship. Dear God, we thank you uh, that you are uh, not surprised and, and by what is going on in the world, but that all these things that are happening in our lives in 2020 uh, has not caught you by surprise. And we find comfort in that. And we, as we take a moment to worship you, to praise you for who you are, we declare that you are God, you are great, you are mighty, and you're worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together.
bless you. So grateful that we can be called your children. All praise goes to you. We thank you for who you are.
Father, we thank you that you are indeed the way maker, the miracle worker, and the promise keeper. We hold on to your promises from your word, the Bible, Lord Jesus. We believe that you are always with us, that you never leave us, nor do you forsake us. And Father, we just um, thank you for that moment of precious worship that we were able to focus in our eyes upon you. And Lord, I just ask that even as we take a moment to read your word and to learn uh, from your written word, the Bible, would you open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to receive what you would have to say to us today. And I pray that the word will not remain as information in our heads, but it will lead to transformation, not only in our hearts, but in our actions through our hands. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you know, um, I don't know about you, but uh, often when I go to a food court, and I miss going to a food court, it's been uh, a few weeks now, but whenever I go to a food court and I order food, one of the things that I always struggle with is um, I would go from store to store and I'll go one circle around the food court and then I'll go another circle around the food court and so often I struggle to decide exactly what to order. And I don't know um, if this is something that happens to you, but so often I start off with something in my mind and I go through all the different options and then I end up right back to uh, the starting point, which was the dish that I thought I should order in the first place. And then when the dishes start arriving for Rita, for others, for my children, I start having a look at other people's dishes and the smells start wafting to my nose. And I look at my own dish and you know what? So often I look at all these other dishes and I thought I think to myself, their food looks so much nicer than mine. Oh, so frustrating. You know, I was at Pack and Save yesterday just to pop in there to get a couple of bits of grocery. And as I got to the entrance, uh, there was this uh, COVID-19 QR code that I had to scan. And so, yep, keep records of your whereabouts. Contact tracing is important. And then after I scanned it, I walked through the sliding doors and there was a person there with a, a thermal camera. I had to take my cap off and they were scanning me for potential fever. And then after that, they gave me a pump of the hand sanitizer. I sanitized my hands. I thanked them for the great service they were doing. And then I walked in to get my one item. I'm sorry, but I usually uh, don't go grocery shopping. But in this particular case, I needed to get this one thing, which is a bottle of milk um, for the office uh, where we are working right now, because there's no more milk. There's three of us in the office, or three to four of us in the office right now, because we, we can't work from home. But anyway, as I was walking through the, the supermarket, I was thinking to myself, gosh, I miss the good old days where I can just pop in and pop out. You know, it's literally, I would do a man shop. You know what a man shop is? A man shop is literally you go in for that one thing you need and you go straight, straight to that aisle, you compare a few prices, you look at a few things and you grab what you need, you hit for, straight for the checkout. You know, the grass is always greener on the other side or the grass is always greener back in the good old days. I don't know if you've ever thought of that, but this phrase often brings to mind that people always think or seem to think that their current situation is not as good as their past situation or somebody else's situation. So today we're going to spend a bit of, mo a bit of time, uh, we're taking a pause from the book of Mark, and we're going to spend a bit of time in the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, and you open the first page and you turn to the right, and it's the second book of the Bible, and we're going to pick it up from Exodus chapter 16, and we're going to cover the entire chapter today. If you've got your Bibles, why don't you grab it, grab it, and then I'm going to not show all the verses on the screen, but I'm going to read through it and follow me along uh, with this story. And I want to unpack a few key points and a few key principles that are so relevant uh, for our situation today. Let me set up, set the scene and set the tone as to what's, what's happening before we start reading the verses from Exodus chapter 16. So if you know the, the story back in the Bible, um, there was a situation where Israel, the people of God, were in captivity under the Egyptian empire. 
So the Egyptian empire had the Israelites as slaves working in their country. And if you've watched the movie called The Prince of Egypt, this guy called Moses, Big Mo, I like to call him. Moses uh, was called by God to lead the people of Israel out of captivity, out of slavery to the promised land. And the story goes that uh, God used Moses to perform 10 incredible, uh, 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 miraculous things called plagues to really force the hand of the Pharaoh to push the Pharaoh to let go of the entire uh, working population because that was the labor force in the land of Egypt back then. So it was a big call for the, um, the, the Pharaoh, the Egyptian Pharaoh, to let God's people go. So the, put, uh, fast forward a, a little bit after the 10 plagues, finally uh, the Israelites started moving and they were uh, allowed to get go into the desert. And then when they got to the Red Sea, there's this incredible scene, this miraculous scene where God actually sent the natural elements, the wind and the waves to part the Red Sea. So much so that the Israelites, I don't know how many there were, but there were hundreds of thousands of them from um, what scholars would say, crossed the Red Sea on dry land. And as they crossed, and the, as the very final person crossed to the other side, the sea started covering up and it was completely back to the original situation. The entire nation of Israel crossed this Red Sea miraculously on dry land because their God answered their prayers to set them free from captivity. And here we come to Exodus chapter 16, not long after they had just crossed the Red Sea. Reading from verse 1, it says, They set out from Elam, which was, a, was a, a nice little oasis in the desert. Incredible, eh? You come to the desert and you find an oasis, which is a place with, with greenery, with water, with uh, lakes, and so forth. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin which is between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate the bread to the full? For you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. What? Are they serious? God had just answered their prayers and set them free from captivity. They were treated as slaves. They were beaten. They were denied so much liberties. They were really been, uh, wanting this exact thing that God has just given them. And here we are, not long after the, 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 the liberty that they've just achieved, they start grumbling against God. The grass is always green on the other side, isn't it? Back in the old days, hey Israel, this is absolutely insane. It doesn't take long for people to start to grumble and to wish they were in their previous situation, doesn't it? Reading on, Exodus, Exodus chapter uh, 16, verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Crazy. Straight after they start grumbling to the Lord, what does the Lord do? He pours out blessing upon them. I mean, if I were the Lord, I would probably start withholding some blessing from them. But God is so good that He overlooks this grumbling lot, this ungrateful bunch of people, and starts pouring and raining down bread from heaven for them. Reading on, on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. 
What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but it's against the Lord. Wow. That's like a slap in the face from Moses to the people. I love what um, the, this, pass, this portion said, where, where God said, Go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Why do you think God asked them to just gather just a day's portion each day? And on day six, gather twice the portion. Well, on day six, they, gather, they were supposed to gather twice the portion because day seven is the Sabbath. They are supposed to not work. And so day six, you add actually gathering for day seven as well. But you see, why was God just giving them enough for that one day? You know, isn't it funny that sometimes in our lives, if you've been a Christian for a while, um, that, that when we ask for God to provide something, He provides us just enough for the next step. Sometimes we're asking God for wisdom, and He seems to shine the light just enough for our very next step. Can, can you imagine yourself in a very dark path or situation, and you're wearing this helmet with a little lamp? You know those types of helmets? Yeah, so you're wearing that, those types of helmets, and then how? imagine it's completely dark. How far will the light shine? Maybe two meters, three meters, four meters, depending on how powerful it is? And how will you see a little bit more of what's up ahead? Even if you turn to the left and to the right, it will only shine as far as the light would go. If you need to see more, you need to begin to take the next step to get closer and closer. Perhaps that's what God wants from His people, the Israelites, and us as His people, that He gives us enough revelation Enough to see and enough to eat, enough provision to, 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 to have so that we would still rely on Him and begin to continue to walk by faith, step by step. And as we walk, as we begin to advance, trusting God, because we can't see what's up ahead, friends, sometimes. We can't see what's up ahead and it's scary. You might be filled with fear. But what we must do, friends, is to remember this God that has come through for us. You see, these, the, Egypt, the Israelites were so forgetful. They had just come out of, a desert, uh, of, of Egypt into the desert, away from slavery. And not long in the desert, God seemed to soften the blow of the desert by bringing them to an oasis called Elam. And yet they forgot what God had just done for them. Maybe God is giving us just enough so that we will continue to rely upon Him. So often we take things into our own hands. The phenomenon of panic buying. So often we let fear take over and we try to keep control. Someone said to me once that change is the only constant in the world. And humans don't handle change very well. I certainly get very unsettled. I like to have a degree of control in my life. I certainly don't handle the change very well. But I need to learn. And, and in terms of my faith in God and my relationship with God, I need to learn to begin to let go of this control and allow God to show me and to lead me and to guide me and to be okay. To only see a glimmer ahead of us. Not easy. Let's read on. Exodus 16, 9. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with the bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Interesting. When Aaron was calling the people, where did they look? They looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. They had just left Egypt and they were complaining and grumbling that, you know, back in Egypt, at least we had this, at least we had that. 
But when Aaron called them, where did they see the glory of God? In the wilderness, in the very place they were fearful of, they were afraid of. They looked headlong into that place that caused fear and concern. And that is where they saw the glory of God. Wow. Are you looking and staring at the face of unemployment? Are you looking and staring at the face of your bank account? Are you looking and staring at the face of a health concern of a family member or yourself? Will you see that God is in the situation with you? Will you see and expect and ask God to demonstrate His glory in the very situation that is gripping you with fear? They didn't look back to Egypt to see God's glory, did they? They looked to the wilderness. Reading on, verse 13. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. Whoa, that's a lot of quail. Flash food. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. A buffet. (laughs) All you can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less, but when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack, meaning you just take what you need, and you had exactly what you needed. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat, and Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it until the next morning. Let no one leave any over of it over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses, did they? Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. Remember how we were just saying that sometimes God provides enough revelation or provision for us for the next step and he says take for that day take for that journey take for it enough for your current season but so often we don't listen we do exactly what the israelites have said have done here they 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 try to 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 retain control they try to gather a bit more and just in case god doesn't come through just in case god forgets just in case god sleeps in and forgets about us right I'm not saying we should, shouldn't be uh, wise and, and with our uh, provisions and our money and save up for the future and plan. No, I'm not saying that at all. But when it comes to trusting God, if God has given you enough direction for today, trust Him. Don't try to do all these other things to try to second guess what God has once uh, given God's instruction for you. As He provides for you, As you believe in Him, as you do your part, if you do your part, God will do His part. Why don't we believe for fresh provision from our God, who is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides? Verse 22, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, Wait a minute, didn't they gather twice as much bread on the other days and then they left it and then the next day it was stinky? Well, let's read on. It says, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each, and when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil and all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they lay it aside until the morning as Moses commanded them and it did not stink and there were no worms in it. Yuck. 
But it's good. Moses said, eat it today, for today is the Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. Interesting, eh? It says, so they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them. It did not stink and there were no worms in it. You know, friends, I believe what this is trying to say to us is when we try to do a specific thing because we're worried and concerned that God will not come through and we try to take matters into our own hands and it doesn't work. But when God tells us when God guides us and leads us with wisdom to do the very thing we just did that didn't work, if it's God's plan and God's direction, and we do exactly the same thing that didn't work before, this time around it will work. What's the difference? The difference is whether we as humans, as people, whether we will trust in God's direction and presence and involvement in our lives. See, it's so often humanity tries to go ahead of God, tries to pull away from God. We try to do our own thing. But when God, this God, the, this God that knows everything, the God that is all powerful, the God that is that is is is, is ever present, and the very definition of love, this very God wants to lead and guide us. Our humanity compels us to try to pull away and do our own thing. It's so frustrating, isn't it? I get caught up with that all the time. And then I realize I've just wasted time. I might as well, I should have trusted God in the first place. On the seventh day, some of the people went out together, but they found none, as God had said. Why would they go out together? Because God already said, there's nothing on the seventh day. See, it's a trust issue. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? Remember earlier in the passage, God said, I'm going to tell you to do all of these things because I'm trying to test you whether you would obey my commandments. Why? Because God knows that the Israelites need to learn to trust him because the journey ahead would be very difficult. When they get to the promised land, there would be battles with the people in the promised land. Things would not be easy. That God's people would need him in the days to come. So at the very start of this journey, God was trying to instill in them the ability to trust him. See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he, has give, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like a coriander seed, white and it tastes, and the taste of it was like wafers made out of honey. Whoa, nice. So Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded you. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. The people of Israel ate the manna for 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. And Omer is the tenth of an epa. 40 years they ate and was provided by God without them having to, to, to work the land, to plant and to farm. God provided everything they needed. You know, sometimes it's so easy for us to go, oh, 40 years, it must be so boring eating the same thing over and over again. Our human nature is such that we will always find uh, almost default to a negative view that, hey, remember that God is feeding you to your hands, Israel. My friends, God is providing for you to your hands. Oh, I don't quite like this job. I'm so sick and tired of the type of uh, the house that I live in, the type of things that I'm doing. I'm so tired of this. But remember the days where you prayed and you prayed and you fasted and you believed for the job and God gave you that job and, hmm, ouch. Isn't that just humanity? All the way to the second book of the Bible, the Israelites. 
friends, my, my family, why don't we try to go in the opposite spirit? Why don't we be grateful to God for all that He has provided for us? See, this last, very last uh, pas- part of the passage says, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, God is so patient with us. He's asking, how long? Will you refuse? But yet he continued to persevere with them. And if you read on in the book of Exodus, you will see so many times that the Israelites would turn away from God and God would punish them a little bit and he would return to them and they will return to him and he would continue to give them the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, the, the hundredth opportunity. Forty years they were in the desert. Some scholars say that the, the actual journey, if you go on a direct path from the Red Sea to the actual promised land, I think it's something like 21 days or three weeks. It took them 40 years. I could only imagine the reason for that was it took them a whole generation to learn to really trust God. Do you want to be in, in, in your situation for 40 years? Or would you rather let go of some of your control and learn to look to Him? Would you look into your wilderness and see God's glory? And this final bit here, let an omer of it be kept throughout your generation so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness, which when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. You know, so often the struggles that we go through, my friends and my family today, the lessons we learn, the mistakes we make, so often these things are meant for the future generation that we can guide them and lead them. I want to encourage you, if you know a younger person or a person younger in their faith, if you're a Christian, why don't you share your testimony? Why don't you share how God has come through for you, some of the mistakes you've done in your faith, that you lost faith in God and you took things into your own hands and it didn't work. And then when you came back to God, He led and guided you. Why don't you pass on your stories to the next generation? Because you know, They say that Christianity is only one generation away from extinction. And you and I, it's on our shoulders, if you're a Christian listening into this, to pass on, to encourage, and to help empower and equip other people to firstly come to a relationship with Jesus and to teach them to grow in that relationship with Jesus and to get them to help uh, get out there to make disciples and to find others to teach and train them and to introduce them to Jesus and to repeat that cycle over and over again so that everyone gets the privilege of having a relationship with the living God. What's all of this saying to us? Well, I think the key point that I want to highlight here is that God is teaching us to seek His presence not just his hands. You see, wherever uh, we go with God, as long as he is with us, that's where we are the safest and should find the most comfort. Well, how do we then seek his presence? Four things. Four T's, I call it. Number one, thank him. Live a a life of gratitude. Take every opportunity you have in your prayer time to thank Him. Give thanks to Him for who He is, for what He's done. Remember the times He's come come through for you. Go back to those things and give thanks to Him. Even though your situation right now is dire, it's not, not easy, it's challenging. Thank Him. Number two, talk to Him. Bear your soul and bear your heart to Him. May your prayer life not be a list of checklist of things just to ask Him a a repetitive set of words that we always utter, just like thanking Him for a meal. Not that that's a bad thing, but talk to your God if you're a Christian. Number three, the third T is take heed. Take heed, listen, pay attention. Look for God uh, in in terms of how He can communicate with you from the Word of God, from, from advice, from wise counsel and people and mentors. Take heed. Listen, don't think that you know better. Don't try to take matters into your own hands and store up for more than one day if he tells you to store up for one day. And number four, the fourth T, is take action. When God tells you something, when he says move, move. When he says reach out to someone, reach out to someone. When he says give, then give. When he says serve, then serve. When he says stop and rest, then stop and rest. 
So the four T's, number one, thank him. Number two, talk to him. Number three, take heed of his words. And number four, take action to his commands. The grass is always greener where God is. Not on the other side, but where God is. Because he is with you wherever you go. As I come to conclude today, during the week I was doing some uh, some devotions and, and, and I was talking to a friend and he asked me, he said, would you write down some promises from the Bible from God that come to mind, top of mind? And, and these are the verses that came to mind. And the, the common ground, I won't read through all these verses, but the common ground between all of these verses, these promises that I remember from the Bible were words like, I am with you in Isaiah. In Matthew, I am with you always to the very end of the ages. Matthew 28, Deuteronomy 31, you, your God who goes with you, he will not leave you nor forsake you. Philipp, Philippians, that the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. He'll be with you. And number the, 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 the final one here I've got in, from John 15, it says, Abide in me and I will abide in you. The presence of God is what we should be looking for, friends. Well, we, as we come to close up today, I want to speak to two groups of people. And let's take a moment to just close our eyes right where you are so that we can have a moment of focus and clarity. Let's take a, a few seconds right now to think about the things you've just heard today and really ask God how that should apply to your life. If you are a Christian here today, with your eyes closed, and you've been in this situation with the lockdown and with, with perhaps any kind of situations in your life that is difficult, and you're wishing that you could go back, you re you're regretting your decisions to be in this situation. You want to go back to the good old days. You're just waiting around for the storm to pass. But then you also see that this yo-yo of lockdown and coming out and lockdown and coming out might happen for quite some time. And you're just losing hope. Just want to go back to the good old days. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for courage, motivation, and energy. If that is you, would you gently put your hand on your heart physically as an indication to God that you would like Him to enter your life to help you if you're a Christian and you're struggling with your current situation, you want to go back to the good old days, I want to pray for you. Dear Lord, you see these people with their hands on their heart, they are indicating to you that they are needing help. They are needing your involvement. They are needing you to help them stop looking back at Egypt and to look into their wilderness and to see your glory and your involvement and your presence and your willingness to guide them. Would you help them to have the courage and the motivation and the energy to thank him, to talk to him, to take heed and to take action, to talk to you, to thank you, to take heed and to take action, Lord. Would you help them right now? Holy Spirit, would you help them in Jesus' name? Amen. I want to talk to a second group of people. And if you're listening in today and you're not a Christian, or maybe you once walked with Jesus, and for whatever reason, maybe you were hurt or life just happened and you walked away from him. I want to pray for you. If that is you, but something you've heard today has made you realize that you need to come back to God. If that is you, would you put your hand on your heart? And I want to pray for you. Lord, you see these hands right where they are, wherever they are, listening into this sermon. God, would you give them the courage the motivation and the energy to lean in to their search for you? Would you give them the courage to reach out to someone who could lead and guide them to begin or reconnect with you, begin a relationship with you or reconnect with you? Or would you strengthen them? Holy Spirit, would you give them guidance and wisdom? In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Friends, if that was you, if you prayed the prayer to come to Jesus for the very first time or to come back to him, we'd love to hear from you. Would you private message us and we'll get back to you. Love to talk to you some more, give you some resources and guide you how to build this relationship with God.
or if you know a Christian friend or someone that has shared with you before about God, would you reach out to them and let them know the great news that you've come, you've decided to want to come to Jesus? Well, we've come to the end of our service tonight, and thank you so much for joining us. And if you're a member of um, Every Nation Auckland City Karaka Nights, and we're going to have a Zoom lounge shortly, straight after the service, and uh, uh, you would have heard uh, or received the Zoom link from your Connect Group leaders. If not, why don't you message this Facebook page, and we will send you the a Zoom link, and we'll see you shortly. For the rest of you, we're going to throw up some questions that you are able to kind of ponder upon or think about or discuss right where you are with the people in your bubble. God bless you. We'll see you again next week.
give Him the glory in this place.